All right, so it's working, you sure? 100% guaranteed. So, I am here with somebody I consider a mentor, have been studying you for, for many, many years. So thank you, Mr. Michael Leachin. We would introduce you as the chairman of the Economic Growth Council for Jamaica, but you're also the, the chairman and founder of Portland Holdings, which has quite a lot under their your flagship is, is NCB, the largest, would it, you said the largest bank in the Caribbean? One of the in, term, in terms of uh, profits. In profits. Well, yes. that's, I think that's the best way to measure, <coughs> to measure banks. So, so I've known you now for a number of years. I consider you a mentor, as we talked about. And every time we've spoken, you've given a framework that I felt was important for people to, to understand about creating wealth and talking about investing in a region. I remember you specifically said that and there were three things that we have to be looking for. One was perception must be different from reality. And number two, you had specifically said that we need to be looking at inefficiencies must exist. And then number three is that there should be a lack of risk capital. Did I get that right? Perfect. Oh, good. All right. I can go home now. You can go. <laughs> I don't need to start speaking anymore. You have the narrative down perfectly. Well, I mean, based on that, we, you know, we've created Blue Marvel Partners wanting to invest in the Caribbean with Jamaica as a beachhead. Having seen what you have done, you invested here in Jamaica and then you've gone to the rest of the Caribbean, but you also invested in India. We tend to think of Jamaica as India, say, 15 years ago or, or even more. We're about to do some things here. And we first really met when you were showing me your Portland India fund. I think many people don't know that you had invested in Infosys of all companies in 2002, Mundra Ports and the says Special Economic Zone in 2007, Adani Power. To, I mean, we, we can go on and on. How do you see similarities between India then that made you invest and then Jamaica now and what we are doing here? Well, it, well David, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, <clears throat> The, the, we are, as you mentioned, the, the, there are three preconditions that are most important to us right. before we really get excited about a wealth creating opportunity. Okay. The first, as you mentioned, is there must be a difference between perception and reality. The second is there must be inefficiencies. And the third is there must be a lack of equity capital flowing into the region, the area, the sector. India, well, it was now 50, 17 years ago, uh, when we were doing the, trans the IT transformation of the bank, uh, <clears throat> my first board meeting, Pricewaterhouse, we had just bought the bank, first board meeting, Pricewaterhouse came in and said, look, we've done a, 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 an audit on the back office IT infrastructure, and it's derelict. <laughs> and it's going to cost you $100 million, and five years to try and totally change wow. it out. So I said, what? A hundred million? Well, we, we just bought the bank. Wow. This is an ambush. Right. We do have a hundred million. And we do have five years. Because if, if you're saying it's derelict now, after five years, before five years, it will be dead. Right. So there's less risk in just doing a big bank conversion right now. So we sought, we went to England, we went to New York and we went to India to find vendor partners. <clears throat> we came across this company in India, in, in, in emphasis in India. And we said, look, this is what we're doing. Uh, this is the price we've been offered. This is what we can afford, 50 million. Uh, do you want a job? And by the way, you'll never have an opportunity to do another bank conversion, IT conversion, bumper to bumper, because no other bank no is going to take that risk. Banks are conservative. This one, it's less risky to do what we are proposing than to maintain uh, the, the status quo. So they said, yes, we'll take it on. So they, and then within six months, they did the conversion. Wow. So I thought, and that gave us an opportunity to have worked with Infosys. Exactly. So I thought, as I now put my asset management cap on, because I'm a money manager. Right. I started off in money management. And I thought, this is a wonderful business because at the core, uh, you invest in things you understand. Having worked with Infosys for six months, we you now understood them from the out, inside out. So we started accumulating shares in Infosys. We eventually became the largest shareholder of Infosys outside of the founders. Right. This was 17 years ago. We all know what Infosys yeah. has done. Yes. <laughs> so that gave us our, our, our taste of investing in Infosys specifically, but also investing in India. 
why we were comfortable with India because we ask one question and if we can't get past this question we're not we're not going the question is would I be confident standing in front of a judge in this country that I'm thinking of investing in if the answer is no I'm not investing they must respect ownership India has a British legal framework I feel comfortable with with, with I uh, with, with, with the framework so we you know, started hunting for more assets in India and we came across Adani Power, uh, sorry, Mundra Ports, which became Adani Port. We even again started accumulating uh, and we became one of the largest shareholders of Mundra slash Adani and then Adani Power, etc. So what we saw in, in India, we saw uh, the, the, the three preconditions being met. Right. Right. So we now come to Jamaica. Jamaica in 2002, when I bought the bank, those three preconditions were in spades. Yes, and nobody right? wanted the bank. <clears throat> nobody wanted the banks. So you just, if, if you're in North America, you don't perceive of Jamaica as a nirvana for investing. But if you're a Scotia bank yes. who invested in Jamaica, in fact, Scotia came to Jamaica in 1889. Before it went to Toronto. Right, it, it was Halifax here. Exactly. And Toronto. Yes. yes. Uh, so if you're a Scotia Bank, you know what the margins are in Jamaica because Scotia in 2001, the year before we bought NCB, uh, there are Scotias in 50 countries. Scotia International, which is in 49 countries right. minus Canada. <clears throat> uh, Jamaica, although they're in 49 countries in 2001, Jamaica provided Scotia International with 25% of its after-tax earnings. Wow. So they knew, they knew <laughs> what the, uh, the, the realities are in Jamaica in terms of a great investment. Right. Scotia Global, in fifth, the, the whole Scotia, in 2001, 8% of their after-tax earnings came from Jamaica. So that's a perception reality difference. Most of us in, in North America, we just not see Jamaica as an investment nirvana. Wow. Dog, uh, principle number one. Second principle, that, 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 that our precondition that has to be there before we get really excited is that there must be inefficiencies, whether it be regulatory inefficiencies, whether it be mispricing inefficiencies, whether it be <clears throat> just operational inefficiencies, financial inefficiencies, but there must be inefficiencies. And when there are inefficiencies, you have an opportunity to buy inexpensively and convert from being inefficient to efficient. And it's in that transformation, you get a huge wealth lift. And the third precondition is there must be a lack of equity capital. Because when you are in an environment where there's a lack of equity cap capital, every incre incremental dollar is hugged, is loved, <laughs> is kissed, right? Right. The converse is when you invest in countries or areas where there's a lot of capital, that incremental dollar is useless. It's a commodity, right? right? So you don't want to be there because uh, uh, when there's a dearth of equity capital, it means that you can buy inexpensively and margins are much better. You can pick and choose versus exactly. we. So, so I keep saying to the, the family office we meet with that we have Everybody is chasing yield now because we have a, a zero interest rate or even negative interest rate environment between the US, Canada, and, and the EU. <coughs> and so the opportunities aren't there. And, and so having worked in private equity in the US, so we saw prices skyrocketing, which you would know because we were paying 10 times, 14 times. There was too much money chasing deals versus here in Jamaica, we don't have as much money chasing those kinds of deals. So you think we have fairer prices or better prices? But you think it's a great place for us to get yield? So, uh, firstly, yield. Uh, interest rates have come down in Jamaica significantly. Right. So, the, uh, the, 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 the Bank of Jamaica's uh, rate today is 1.25%, re reflecting inflation. Uh, and it's not expected to go up. Uh, to, uh, uh, significantly. In fact, the problem now is we have too low inflation. Too low inflation. Uh, so yield has come down significantly. But in, in this environment, uh, and especially 
given that historically, uh, over the last 20 years, prior to 2016, which is when I became the chairman of the Economic Growth Council, Jamaica showed a GDP growth rate of 0.5%, the worst in the Western Hemisphere. The 10 years prior to 2016, we showed a growth rate of 0.2%. It stepped down, wow. the absolute worst in the Western Hemisphere. But at that point, I can remember, we are doing a roadshow we're looking at taking the National Commercial Bank, NCB, right. uh, doing an IPO on the, the New York Stock Exchange. So we did 66 uh, interviews or presentations in 10 days in London, New York, Los Angeles, Toronto. Wow. In London, in 2013, May of 2013, the uh, response was, Mike, NCB, beautiful, con uh, beautiful house, Bad neighborhood. <laughs> wow. Went to New York. NCD, beautiful house, bad zip, zip code. code. Wow. 2013. March of, May of 2013. Coincidentally, that's five years ago. Coincidentally, six years ago. Coincidentally, Bloomberg came out uh, in December of 2018. And the, well, January of 2018, and they said the number one stock exchange in the world in 2018 was Jamaica. And the number one stock exchange five, over the last five years from 2013 <laughs> to 2018 was in Jamaica, Jamaica, showing a cumulative rate of return of 233% profit, right? right? Appreciation. The coincidence was when... We were doing the roadshows 2013. That's when they were saying bad neighborhood, bad zip code. Right. So probably that is confirmation that you should look for the warts. Don't look for perfection. You look for perfection, you're gonna pay for perfection. For perfection. Right? But the only caveat to that is uh, when you look when you're in an inefficient uh, uh, environment, you have to make sure that the will is there, whether government will. Or, or whatever will, bureaucratic will, to change from the, for change that situation. So Jamaica today, uh, we are, we are uh, in 2018, we showed a growth rate of 1.8%, which is nine times the 10 year average. Wow. So, and there's, a, there's the confidence rate in Jamaica is the highest it has ever been historically. Debt to GDP has come from 147%, it's now 96%. And heading down to 60. And heading, exactly. Uh, NIR, strongest it has ever been. Uh, inflation has come from probably uh, 12%. It's now down to less than 2%. 2%. So the government has, is really business friendly and is really, uh, has uh, accepted the, the, the stringencies from the IMF and it has done a remarkable job at uh, imposing fiscal discipline on ourselves. No, and, and I love that because we, we get to know we have models for Greece and all these other countries that have had problems. But Greece, Greece got off. They got off the easy. Because the primary uh, 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 surplus. primary surplus for uh, for Jamaica was 7%. That's what IMS imposed. Yes. Greece was 1%. One. One. But it was good because the pain was bitter initially. But it, it is, it, that's the reason why we paid on debt so quickly. So, quickly. so we suffered the short-term medicine, right. and we are now reaping the long-term Benefit. benefits. And we see the difference between us and Greece now. So, so one of the things I always spoke about, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, I've had to follow you a few times. So at the UE Leeds NCB sponsored, you spoke the first year, I had to speak the second year. You know, Jamaica Stock Exchange, you've spoken, <laughs> I've spoken. And I never forget when I had spoken to them, I reminded our audience that Jamaica used to be on top of the world, certainly in the Western Hemisphere. We have the seventh largest natural harbor in the world, just like Singapore is next door to a big country, China. We have the US, they have a big harbor. You know, we talk about Port Royal and Boston used to be the two richest cities in the world in the 1400s. You come from Portland, so you know this. I mean, we supplied about like 40% of the bananas in the world at one point, Greek gold. <coughs> what has happened that you think led to where we went down but now, can we actually become a Singapore of the West or, or something different, but on that level? You know, I was fortunate in that in 1969, 
I left high school and I was able to get a job because in 1969, our GDP growth was 5.97%. 1970, I was able to, able to keep my job because growth in Jamaica in 1970 was 11.9%. Double digits. Do exactly. That's in 1970. So I was fortunate. So I have reaped the benefit of growth. Now, the problem is, I have, a, I have a mantra, and it goes like this. Success begets complacency, begets failure. So we became complacent, and the rot set in. Right? We became complacent. So we are now cleaning up 40 years of rot. Wow. Right? Which is where the opportunity is. Because we are, if, 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 we, if you parachuted your home from Jamaica and drop it in Cayman, it would be worth five to ten times. That's true. Right? But, again, we are now... We have a, the second point is, people don't change when they are self-satisfied. You change only when you are disgusted with yourself. We became disgusted with ourselves in 2013. We say we are bright. <laughs> Yet still, we have the worst track record for GDP growth in the Western Hemisphere. How bright could we be? Exactly. So that was the disgust we had in ourselves. <laughs> and when you're disgusted, that's when you're open to change. And that's the reason why we, were, we, 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 we brought our economic matrix in, uh, in, in line with... Uh, uh, in, in fact, our, our passing of IMF tests is a model within the IMF, <laughs> the realm of IMF. Countries. Right, it's never happened so consistently. <laughs> so, so one of the things that I've studied that you shared with me a number of times, and every article anybody can see, they talk about it. But it's your your five. I don't even want to call them preconditions. A framework when we think of wealthy people. So, so we don't want people <laughs> to think of you, but I mean, you are literally on the Forbes list. When we look at the black billionaires in the world, Forbes estimates two point two. But there's a lot of private stuff. It's, Great private doing more than that. We don't have to get into it's that. 2. No, it says two point two, and you're somewhere in the thirteen hundred. But that's this is alongside people like Robert Frederick Smith and Oprah Winfrey and mm -hmm. Dan Gotti. And for you to be spending so much time in Jamaica for me is amazing. But you point out to us. Think of anybody on the Forbes list on the wealth. Like let's think about real wealth. And they say number one is that the person has a few businesses, mm -hmm. private, private. Yes. Right. Number two. Yes. Is that they're domiciled in strong long-term growth industries. Yes. Number three, they understand the business. Yes. And, and usually those businesses are run by mm -hmm. uh, management that they trust. Mm -hmm. And is also highly concentrated in ownership. So they run like private family-run business. They, yes. They're going to feel paid. Right. Uh, number four is that they use other people's money very well. Prudent managers of capital. Am I yes. getting those right? Perfect. And then the most important one, though, that yes. most people forget is that we have to hold it for the long term. Yes. And so... You think that we can use that same framework in Jamaica, and I think you've proven it when Columbus Communication, I'd love for you to talk about that specific deal that you had done and how that had fit in with your framework. Well, first, uh, Columbus Communication is a perfect example of the three preconditions that we mentioned earlier. Right. Uh, uh, at the time, so we, we owned a company called Cable Bahamas, 35% of Cable Bahamas, and Cable Bahamas provided uh, cable services to the Bahamian people. So being an incumbent operator and in market operator, we uh, we were being charged uh, forty eight thousand dollars per month for a T one data line. Oh. Now we said we're we're from Canada. This thing costs in the hundreds of dollars or less than a thousand, right? Forty eight thousand a month? We said no 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 no. We aren't gonna pay that. We're gonna build an undersea cable from uh, Boca Raton to Freeport. So when we, we made the announcement, uh, uh, the incumbent teleco dropped the price from $48,000 per month to $24,000 per month. Wow. When we landed, they dropped the price further from 24 to 16 and 12. We came in at 6 <laughs> and we grabbed 60% market share. That gave us a taste of the business. We said, wow, this is a great business. You lay the cable, put out major capex, and then the operational expenditure to maintain it, right. not, much. not much. 
right? But you know, start uh, getting revenues and your margins are, 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 are increase, right? Are increasing. So Jamaica came out with an RFP and, uh, for a second uh, cable outlet from Jamaica, undersea cable from Jamaica. So we made a bid for it. Right. We won it. So we now searched the, the, the Caribbean to see uh, how, if there are any stranded assets, and we came up, we came across the Arcos network, which Motorola in the late 1990s spent 450 million US dollars laying the, 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 the undersea cable from, and it went from Boca Raton to Cancun, Mexico, and it hops to every single Central American com country, up the Eastern Caribbean, passes Trinidad, uh, uh, Easter, uh, Barbados, Dominican Republic, uh, back to US Virgin Island, back to Miami. So it was a complete rig. Uh, the day 450, was, and in 2000, in the early 2000, we didn't have uh, smartphones, no, we didn't have Google, we didn't have no Facebook, Netflix, no Netflix. So down, the broadband traffic was low. So the highway was built, but there was no traffic. So it went bankrupt, no different from Global Crossing. This was the Caribbean Crossing. Right. So we bought it for 80 million. They spent 450, we bought it for 80. We uh, rehabilitated it, and that, that became our wholesale uh, uh, teleco business, uh -huh. right? Then we superimposed on top of that uh, a retail business where we started selling, doing the triple play, All right? right? Uh, that this, this was back in 2005, six. In 2013, we sold that business to Cable and Wireless uh, for three. It was the largest transaction in Latin America in 2013. We sold it to Cable and Wireless for three billion dollars. Wow! So people think the Caribbean doesn't have scalable investment, Investments. but that's not true. That's that's one opportunity. Digicel. Digicel is another op uh, opportunity that was started by Mr. Dennis O'Brien in 2001. Right. Digicel is now worth multi-billion. Right. NCB. When I bought NCB, the market cap of NCB was 200 million. Today, today's uh, market cap of NCB is probably about 3.2 billion US. Right. And I'd love since you bring up NCB and the market cap. We obviously, we grew up loving Warren Buffett. You have told yes. me in the past, the first thing you ever told me was David needs to find a role model. Get the recipe, don't change the recipe until you exceed the role model. And so I think we have similar role <laughs> models. And so when you talk about that NCB versus S&P 500 versus Berkshire, you showed me a graph recently and it, it blew my mind. Mm -hmm. Can you just go over the growth that you've seen over that time? Well, <clears throat> if you had uh, in the, if you had $100,000 back in 2002, right. you had many alternatives, one of which would have been you could have invested in the S and P five hundred, so a hundred thousand would be worth three hundred twenty-two thousand dollars today. today. Most money managers would have done less, less. than the, the S and P five hundred. You could have taken your hundred thousand and bought uh, J, uh, the J, uh, Morgan Stanley Emerging Markets Index. It would be worth four hundred twenty-nine thousand dollars today. You could have taken your hundred thousand and bought, bought Berkshire Hathaway. Right. It would be worth. 422,000, and by the it's not today, it's as of last December. Right. Uh, it would have been worth, Berkshire would be worth 422,000. Had you taken the, the 100,000 and bought NCB, you'd be worth, in US dollars, it would be worth 2.2 million dollars. As of last December, as of today, 2.5, 2.6 mm. million. million dollars. From, from 100,000. Yes. That so, so that proves the point. Proof of point, proof, proof of the point, proofs would be number one, the JSE, Jamaica Stock Exchange, being right. number one. Uh, NCB's performance in an inefficient market. Wow. So, <laughs> so you know what we're planning to do. We're raising equity capital in the United States to bring down here to invest in Jamaica and the wider Caribbean, but Jamaica is a beachhead. Using those frameworks, you think that this is the right time for people to be looking at those kinds of opportunities? Well, uh, th there are very few opportunities in the world whereby you 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 should have confidence in in the legal framework. Right. 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 Jamaica's legal framework is British. Uh, Jamaica, by virtue of its location, right, is ideally located, and th there is no reason why 
given Jamaica's location, you leave, leave the Panama Canal, the first country you're seeing, you, if, you, if you keep going straight, you, you run right <laughs> into Jamaica. Run right into Jamaica. Uh, so, so, so we have a large population, relatively large population, 3 million people, so it's not small, That's right? Enough. Population wise. Good, great landmass, natural resources, time zone, and good pro proximity to the strongest markets in the world. Right, so there's, the US and South America. So there's no reason why Jamaica should not be the Singapore of the Western Hemisphere. And the Chinese look at it that way because as we speak, they are uh, in the middle of implementing six billion US dollars. US. US in St. Elizabeth, Jamaica, starting with a power plant, a revival of, their, of, of, the, of the bauxite aluminum company, then building a power plant, and then going to build a light industry, uh, a city that revolves around light industries right. uh, with light aluminum, manufacturing. Wow. light manufacturing with aluminum products. And I remember growing up, dad would always tell me, which you, you met him, and, and so that was amazing. First of all, I want to say thank you for giving your time. Uh, like when we met, he, had, he was about the Portland in your phone, and dad asked you, after you called him out about the five frameworks, you had to think of someone, and he specifically I spoke to him afterwards. He said, I'm about to retire in a few years. Could I get some advice? And he spent 35 minutes with him one-on-one. -on -one. So, so that was amazing. And, and that gave me insight into you as a person, you know, giving back, paying it forward. But one of the things that I always said was that the reason our bauxite industry was just extractive, just the red dirt and then we ship off the ore, was because electricity was so expensive in Jamaica. But now that the Chinese are going to have their own <coughs> power plant that brings on the cost so they can actually have an aluminum smelter and we can move up the value chain. Right. And so the same thing now we just opened up a massive power plant, solar power plant that's now plugged into the grid. I think that's at like eight cents or something per kilowatt hour. Some yes. It's not double digits that we're used to, so that's amazing. <coughs> we have a wind farm that the government just went public. I'd love for you to talk about that diversification of assets, uh, divesting of assets. So the government is saying we are no longer <coughs> the home for some of these assets. We can either divest directly by selling, and in this case, it was more inclusive, they use a stock exchange, or they're actually doing, you know, we're doing PPPs. We want to do private you know, relationships with public. And so we did that with Norman Mann International Airport and Sangsa. So give us a little feedback on how that is looking and, and why the governments have, have done that. Well, well, we have a business-friendly government. Uh, <clears throat> you mentioned that I'm the chairman of the Economic Growth Council. And uh, I was appointed in 2016. In 2016, uh, and the mandate is to uh, develop a set of policies that the government can follow right. that will uh, result in uh, growth. Uh, so we, we, since 2000, March of two, May of 2016 until now, Right. Three years, the EGC, this is unprecedented in the world. We have had f over 400 meetings with stakeholders. The first 75 meetings, wow. what we did, we listened to the st st stakeholders of Jamaica. We collated what we heard in terms of the, the ails of Jamaica and also the, the, the solutions. Right. And we came up with uh, a, a manifesto. Right? which included eight growth initiatives, 111 sub-initiatives, wow. which became and is the, legis uh, is the basis of the legislative agenda for the Jamaican government. Wow. One of those eight growth initiatives was we had to be di government divestiture of uh, public assets into the hands of the private sector. Right. And more importantly, it's not just a divestiture because what, we're, what we want is because we know a lot of wealth is being create, lift created. We want for the wealth to be democratized. Exactly. Right? So we're not only just divesting, we're divesting through a publicly traded vehicle so Jamaicans can participate in the wealth creation that is happening in Jamaica. So number one, it's a national imperative. Number two, uh, it's being done in such a way that Jamaicans can participate in the wealth creation that's occurring. Number three, it's an imperative because we want to keep paying down debt. Right. And number four, we have these assets that are, uh, uh, are, are I, I once did a speech to the Organization of American States, OAS, and I said, you know, government, if I, the best business in the world is to be in the business of collecting taxes. Right. Because 
you have all the citizens working for you and your partners with them, right? right? So if I had a business, I'd be giving them the ultimate customer service, go out and make more money, create more wealth, right, create more wealth. because you're, you're, you're giving more taxes, more taxes, right? So that's, I guess that's the attitude, right? Put these assets in the hands of the private sector. They're gonna create wealth, they're gonna provide profits, create profits, and I'm gonna participate. I'm the government. Right. I'm gonna participate with them. So the more the merrier. Well, so, oh, so now I understand why our tax efficiency seems to be moving along. We can now pay taxes online here in Jamaica. The TAJ is doing a good job. Uh, there's always room for growth. But no, so I, I love how you put that. That's great. Uh, one of the things I also noticed, having studied Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore, uh, in his book <laughs> from from third to first, he pointed out. And they had done the whole special economic zone model. And they actually then used their model to go into China and help China to build out their, their own. We have a, a, a whole program here for, for SEZs. How is that coming along? And is it, do we have Singapore actually consulting with us in any way? Or did they help us? Or do we not, that model is too old and it's not Well, 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 well firstly, uh, it is, we, we, the first thing, we're conscious Right. the asset that we have uh, which is location right, right. we are conscious that uh, we have the other asset is the British legal framework the other asset is time zone yes right and as you mentioned we have the seventh largest naturally sure. protected harbor so it's beautiful it's perfect now it's just in terms of execution we now have uh, the government is now doing the space has now done really the spatial plan they've designated what areas uh, will be used for what okay. so we're in the process we're still in the process we have to get customs right so there's still certain infrastructure things that we have to get right but at the same time we have to be going out there and selling right right so this is the process this is where we're at now so five years from now uh and, and part of part of this was a divestiture of kingston container terminal, terminal. which is the government owned uh port into the hands of a French company, CMA, CMG, right? right. Uh, so that's, so we, we are well, five years from now, you uh, will not recognize this country. This country. I mean, and so we are, we are dredging the port to make it deeper to allow post Panamax vessels to land there so we can have, you know, 40,000 TEUs, all these kind of yes. things. I can't wait to do a tour. You have invested in Kingston Wharves in the past. We were we bought yeah uh, we had bought in two thousand and three, uh, we bought thirty six percent of Kingston Wharves. <laughs> so you I, I I love that. So is that what influenced you buying into Mundra Port in two thousand? Yes, yes, basically because we having invested in Kingston Wharves, we realized we we, we first became uh, we comfortable with that type of that type asset, of business, right. that type of business, and then. Uh, so Mundra, when we, the opportunity came up, we just leveraged from our new house. So we could we could diligence, we know what to look for, etc., right. etc. And then, so I think many Jamaicans don't realize that the International Seabed Authority is based here. I mean, the, we, the, we the headquarters. The headquarters is yes. based here. We we should really be <coughs> doing a lot more in shipping and logistics. I yes. understand we we're going to have a much stronger hub that's being built. We have major companies setting up more things here. Steve Dorian is going to be happening. We have ship registry, something mm -hmm. that's that's been in the works already. So, I mean, is there? Well, for me, yeah, we we wrapping up now, and I, I really want to, to leave everybody watching, especially young people. I think I'm still young. I've been told that I'm not that young anymore. <laughs> but there was an interview you did many years ago in Dolce Magazine, and and you, you, there was a quote in there that really hit me personally. It's a, I tell you, it's the it's the best quote <laughs> I've ever seen in my entire life because it put today in perspective for me when I was born and he said that you know you're lucky to be born now you're born in an era where you could own a pair of shoes if you had been born 250 years ago you would be owned you would be a slave and so there are you know things that factors that have helped you become successful that had nothing to do with you we are we are lucky we are fortunate I'm trying to tell young people that the ones in Jamaica know you are lucky to be born now with, with the internet and penetration of cell phones and it would be irresponsible not to take advantage of those opportunities. How do you look at that or what would you tell them around that quote that you have? I would say, well, we're fortunate. Uh, yes, that's true. But it's easy if you have not experienced growth 
not to know what it looks like, not to know what it feels like, not to know what it smells like, and you don't trust that it's going to continue. So that's easy. Therefore, it's very, the natural default is to do nothing. Because you're going to say, well, look at what has happened in the last 20 years. Right? Right. And uh, so what can I expect in the next 20 years? Why should I expect differently? But we have had structural changes. Right? Yeah. Uh, we, we, uh, we, 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 I can remember back in 2013, uh, the then finance minister, uh, Minister Peter Phillips, said, Mike, this is just before uh, we, we signed the IMF agreement. Mike, I will do anything to make sure we don't get back into this situation. Wow. Because I had to literally, figuratively, crawl across the room on my belly to beg for help. I'll never put another generation of Jamaica through that. We're too blessed to be to have done that. Yeah. So we we'll, I do anything to make sure we don't get back in that situation. So we now have to believe it's a different day now and we're not going back there. Yeah. So if you have confidence, if you have confidence, your behavior is totally different from if you're tentative. So I'm saying nobody has ever created, done anything outstanding in their life by being tentative, yeah. right? You have to have confidence. And the good news is we now, we can, we now can show, show momentum, we can show uh, metrics, right. that, and we can show that by virtue of studies, surveys, that the confidence level is the highest it has ever been. So if we're confident, we invest in Jamaica, and read the words, as I have over the last uh, 17 years in Jamaica. No, well, I want to thank you for your time. I want to encourage everybody else in the diaspora, like us, you are in you know, Canada, I am in Miami, in the US. We want to get more of us, one being good ambassadors, so we can't talk bad about the country. We need to recognize their shape, so we need to talk good about the country, and we need to put our money here in Jamaica. Well, if we don't invest, we are... Uh, uh, we're taking a bit. The risk now is not being investing. That's the risk now. All right. Thank you very much. I can't wait to sit down with you again. Really You're welcome. It. You're welcome, David. <laughs>